A totally different technique for detecting gravitational waves is to use pulsars with rotation rates greater than 100 times per second, called millisecond pulsars. Instead of using interferometers to measure the tiny changes in the length of an arm, it uses the variation in the time it takes for pulsar light to reach Earth. For example, suppose there's a pulsar 3,588 light years away with a pulse every two milliseconds. In this example, a supermassive black hole in spiral creates a gravitational wave that increases the time between pulses by two microseconds over six years. That's 600 meters, giving us a strain of 2 times 10 to the minus 16. One of the keys to the success of the method is the extremely accurate measurement of each pulse's arrival at the radio telescope, called the time of arrival, or TOA for short. Given the arrival time of one pulse, we would just add pulsar rotation time to calculate the expected time of arrival for the next pulse with a few adjustments for things like the Earth's rotation, the orbital motion of the Earth and the pulsar if it's in a binary system, the dispersion delay caused by electrons in the interstellar medium, and a few additional relativistic effect items. Differences between the actual time and the expected time are called residuals. For a steady state situation, we would see the average over time as a horizontal line but a very long period gravitational wave would continuously increase the proper distance traveled by a pulse over a long-term observation program. This plot shows the effect of an increase in travel time of two microseconds over six years. That's the 600 meters in this example. Of course, thorough analysis is needed to rule out other causes for a graph like this. For example, we would see this residuals pattern if instead of a gravitational wave, the pulsar's rotation rate was actually slowing down. Another way to find gravitational waves with pulsars is to use an array of them and measure the distances to and the viewing angles between all of them over time. That's enough to compute the distances between them as well. As gravitational waves pass through the array, we should see deviation patterns that are correlated across all the pulsars in the array. In recent years, a large number of radio wave observatories across the globe have formed teams to find gravitational wave patterns. The frequencies of the gravitational waves detected by the pulsar timing array teams are at the lower end of the frequency scale called nanohertz. A nanohertz gravitational wave is generated by massive objects that are far enough apart to take 15 years or more to make one orbit. To create enough strain to enable detection, these objects would have to be supermassive black holes, like those residing at the center of most galaxies. For example, consider the two supermassive black holes at the center of NGC 6240 that we covered earlier. It's 400 million light years away orbiting each other 2,240 light-years apart. One is 97 million times the mass of our Sun. The other is 440 million times the mass of our Sun. Calculating the period, frequency, wavelength, and strain, we see that the gravitational waves created are deep in the noise and undetectable. But by the time the distance between them is around 5,000 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun, we get detectable waves. These are the kinds of waves that the world's pulsar timing array projects are designed to detect. Here are the regions covered by pulsar timing and pulsar timing arrays on our sensitivity graph. 